I just want to give you my top programs in college football. And I want to give you the disclaimer. Here's what I care about. As we know, these rankings are going to be above reproach. The JP poll is spitting them out. The JP poll gets dusted off once a spring and we're doing full program breakdowns. An announcement that I'll probably use in Twitter replies later. This is not meant to be predictive. It's not meant to forecast where you will go in the coming years. It's meant to reflect what you have been and what you are here and now. I value, when defining a program, a three to four year rolling blend of on-field results, how much have you won, talent acquisition, how good are you recruiting and portaling, how good are you developing that talent, the resource pool you have at your disposal, and overall synergy or togetherness of your program and to a larger degree, your athletic department. That's how we define programs. The number one program in college football right now is the University of Georgia. Not sure it takes too long. We didn't need the drum roll on this. 42 and three with two titles over the last three seasons kind of speaks for itself. I think it's the top coaching staff, pound for pound in college football right now. Kirby Smart, I would power rate as the number one head coach in college football right now. It's the second layer with Georgia, ironically, that's the most impressive to me. Sure, everyone sees the talent. Everyone sees the NFL draft pick assembly line. Got a premier head coach. uh, Got top flight coordinators and assistants. It's the second layer, though. It's the names you don't even know. You know, like when Del McGee got hired away from Georgia at Georgia State, the biggest fight they had on their hands at Georgia was Dell came for the second layer guys, the assistants and the backups here and there that you don't even know. Most Georgia fans don't know, but they're quality people. That's why they're in that building. They're strong beneath the top layer. They're strong. And obviously when it comes to roster, we would just call that depth. It's also, I think probably the most intense environment to work in or play in, in college football. And it yields results like you've seen over the last couple of years, Georgia, number one, Alabama number two program in college football right now. There is a lot of thought out there that once Nick Saban steps aside, then you got to reset this. Well, as I said, this is not predictive, but if it were predictive, I'm not sure I'd change a whole lot. So let's just say for the sake of argument, we're taking predictive modeling into account here. They've got two SEC titles the last three years, but that was under Saban, right? Uh, They lost a legend. I think they added an elite head coach. We had Kalen DeBoer on the show last week. Met with a lot of his, met with the vast majority of his staff on and off the record last week. So got a good look under the hood early on of the new Alabama program. I want you to know something though. You just watched him in the final four in basketball. I have a resource theory about Alabama. Uh, it actually goes like this. They didn't have to realize their resource potential under Saban because he was Saban. And so there's a misnomer out there, and this is a theory of mine, that Bama doesn't quite have the top end on the old NIL speedometer that some of the other programs have, and they don't have that deep resource pool that some of the other programs have. Could be true. What I do know is they haven't needed it. And so now you'll have a little different strain put on that fan base and especially the deeper pockets in that fan base than has been in the past. I actually think they're going to be all right on that front. I think they're going to be all right in recruiting. Talent acquisition period has been elite. I think it will remain, whether it's elite or not, in the top five to seven range in college football. That's actually an interesting side point that we could talk about all day. But when Kalen DeBoer came there, Uh, I also think that he brought a very, very good staff. And even with the losses of Grubb and Huff, I still think it's a really good staff. But that's all that's all predictive. So I'm trying to explain to you, I'd still buy into them being the number two program in the country, even if this were predictive. But if we're just looking at the last three years, rolling blend, record, talent acquisition, resource pool stability. Yeah, Alabama's way up there. I've got, well, I've got a shameful admission for you when it comes to number three. In fact, I changed this in the last, what, Jesse, two hours, I think. And producer Jesse and director Colin aren't even in the building. They are down in Fort Lauderdale. And so the only way I can hear them is in my ear. And the only way I can talk to them is via phone and text. You remember a couple of, probably like a month or two ago now, we did this, but we did it for conferences. So I put out my Big Ten program rankings, basically the same criteria. And I had Ohio State ahead of Michigan. I explained my thinking. Some people agreed, some people disagreed. I am now disagreeing with myself. Probably the first major flip-flop, not to be the last, 
that I am admitting to in the year of our Lord 2024 is I think I messed that up. So I'm putting Michigan as the number three program in college football right now. It is not predictive. So anyone who wants to talk about Sharon Moore, anyone who wants to talk about how they're going to fall off, we can have that talk if you believe that. It just doesn't belong here. Uh, Here's the bottom line. We've got to value on-field results a lot more than I did the first time around here. I think Ohio State recruits better than Michigan. Have they developed as well as Michigan the past three years? I don't think so. Have they beaten them on the field the past three years? I don't think so. And so we got to value that. Like, I didn't value it enough. Uh, There are a lot of other areas where I think Ohio State has the edge over Michigan, and maybe in the future we add on-field results. But in the meantime, there's a bunch of questions, but it's not predictive. And so as, as to where they have been, 13-1, and 15-0 uh, with the national championship last year, and then sent a plethora of guys to the NFL Combine, so they've developed as well as any program in the country. Um, I think that they've recruited good, they've developed excellent, and now they're also going to be met with a ton of doubt. When's the last time a premier program won a title and was doubted? as readily as this Michigan program is about to be. And I don't know that that really fits into this conversation because that is what it is. Whether they go 0-12 or 12-0 this upcoming year has nothing to do with what I think in the here and now about where their program is. But I moved Michigan up, moved them ahead of Ohio State. Ultimately, all the rest of this stuff is about winning on the field. That's really what it's all about. And you could luck into one, and you could pull an upset as a 14-and-a-half-point dog every now and then. That doesn't prove your program's better than their program. It just proves football happened on a given afternoon. But when you do it again and again and again, and then you cap it off with a championship run, and by the way, you have your pick of where you want to go, and you hire Sharon Moore. They could have gone outside. It's not like they were without options. I have questions about the stability and the depth of their NIL up there. I have questions about just how unstable it turns out some of the staffing pieces were after Harbaugh left, but that's, that's for 2024. Uh, this is a here and now look at this. Now, if you couldn't tell, Ohio State, I've got right behind them at number four. So this absolutely will be the biggest debate point in these rankings, and there's negligible difference between the two. If we were doing the just straight up JP poll power rating system, just fractions here and there. But it doesn't matter because one's got to be ahead of the other. Everything's pretty much elite. Everything's on point the way it needs to be at Ohio State, except the on-field piece against Michigan and not having won a national championship, whereas Georgia and like uh, Michigan have. So you're way up there. Uh, recruiting has been incredible. Defense is now a strength for this program. I think one of the biggest evolutionary points in the Ohio State program under Ryan Day is they are no longer a team any given year that has to outscore folks. That's a big point that probably is not going to get its proper respect until they win a title. And when they win a title, especially if it's this year, Ryan Day will be viewed as a genius and a lot of doubters will have disappeared, but I'll tell you the thing that they're gonna talk about in that future context, if it happens, is, boy, what a tactical move by Ryan Day to to identify the weak points of his program and bring in Jim Knowles. Well, he already did that. You know, like, it's already two years, three years into that experiment. It works, whether it'll yield a title or not, it's worked, and so that's part of your program. Your development is really good there. Recruiting's elite. A resource pool, I don't really think we even need to talk about that. Got to win a title. Got to beat Michigan. That, that's the only way that they basically climb above where they are right now. Now, I had a little bit of back and forth, paper pop, in my own mind about who the number five program in college football is right now. If you're tuning in live, yeah, it looks like a ranking because it is a ranking. This is not some preseason poll. It's not you know, who I think is going to win the title this year. I'm talking about programs, and a lot more goes into a program's definition than just what you are in this very moment, and we just ignore what you were in 2022. You can't do that. Otherwise, we're just rating teams, which we can do, and we will do, but we're not doing it right now. I put Texas as the number five college football program in the country, so let me walk you through my thinking on this. The on-field results have started to speak for themselves. They've really started to spike under Steve Sarkeesian. Energy and synergy 
they're not exactly the same, but they fit because the same can be used to describe both. Excellent. And it's what Texas fans longed for under the previous several regimes, and they've now got it with Sark and his guys at Texas. The sport is built for them right now. Everything that is a strength at Texas, you can do in college football. In fact, I was talking to a very, very distinguished UT alum earlier today, and he said, I wish people would shut up about salary caps and about even revenue sharing. We don't want that at Texas. Forget that. We got it right where we want it, Texas, right now. They're recruiting out of this world. They can portal in whoever they need to. Uh, I think this year's team, it, not that that's what we're talking about now, but this year's team will ultimately go as far as those new imported pieces will take them, which as a fan is always what gives me a little cause to just, just not quite put an exclamation point on the end of my sentences in the summer because I do value culture and I do love when guys have come in together and been developed in my program and it always makes me a little leery when I have to go outside the walls of my program for that many pieces. But it also is the new world of college football. Pretty much everyone's doing it outside of Michigan last year. Every team in the future that wins the title is probably going to have several notable additions via the portal. Recruiting's there, resources are there, on-field results are there. Synergy, I think, is there. Here's why my tone changed. There's never been more pressure on Steve Sarkeesian in his life than there will be this point moving forward professionally at Texas, personal life notwithstanding. There's never been a brighter spotlight on a lot of the guys on that staff now and a lot of guys inside that program than there will be from this point moving forward at Texas. I am cautiously optimistic that this will not be an issue there. I cannot be totally convinced until I see year over year stability with the program. This stuff's not easy. I'm just point blank telling you, this stuff's not easy if you're in bed at 8.30 every night and it's an apple a day and you get up at 5 a.m. and you're ready to go. Uh, these are people and people have flaws. And a lot of times you can fix your flaws and it's wonderful and it's a great story. Other times uh, pressure can expose people. And that's what I'm always cautious about. I'm pulling for him, but that's what I'm always cautious about here. When Bo Davis left there, I looked at it and I said, well, that's, that's interesting, huh? And they added Kerry Baker and they've got a phenomenal staff this year, probably slightly downgraded from last year, uh, but in and of itself, that's not a big deal. I just, I, I don't ignore that kind of stuff is what I'm saying. So I got Texas at number five, because everything I just talked about, even if it is met with a negative ending, is in the future. But it's part of what the program is right now. So, that's not meant to be anything more than it is. That's just me openly and uh, baselessly wondering aloud. Oregon is the number six college football program in the country right now. Double digit wins the last three years. And yet the program doesn't feel like it's arrived, does it? I think they've rapidly climbed program rankings. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have had Oregon number six a few years ago, but yet you watch them come up short against Washington twice last year. Hasn't been a playoff team yet. Hasn't been a national championship team yet, which I think is a really good place to be because elsewhere, resources, it's Oregon. No one's ever going to doubt that. Uh, extremely intense and laser focused staff up there. Lanning is locked into Oregon for the next 150 years, so you got plenty of runway there. You don't have to have the doubts in the back of your head like you did when Mario was up there. Could he one day leave? Well, with Mario, you had reason to think that way. I don't think you have much reason to think that way with Dan Lanning. And then you look at the talent acquisition. I've never seen Oregon recruit like this, ever. There have been some times where Oregon recruited pretty well. They've never recruited like this. And the transfer portal has also met that program at the opportune moment. But the other thing is there's room to climb. So they're, they're sitting number six right now as a program, and there's room to climb. Because the crowd that is 10 or bust, as I like to call them, that's the crowd that thinks if you haven't won a championship, you've never done anything. That crowd looks at Oregon. That crowd looks at Dan Landing and says, what have they won? What has he won? Well, a whole lot of football games. And he's been a head coach for about 35 minutes also. So 
it is fair to give guys a little time to get their footing under them. It's only the most tumultuous time in the history of the sport for anybody, much less new coaches. So what has he won? Hey, what have you won? No, I'm not even going to go down that road. That's an apples to oranges. Hey, what about Notre Dame? We all know how this is going to end, but I had to put Notre Dame somewhere. Notre Dame I have is the number seven overall program in college football right now. Double digit wins, not just two out of the last three years, people. They've got double digit wins seven of the last nine years. Josh, they don't play anyone. That's a lie. We've dispelled that myth nine ways from Sunday, so we're not going to do it on this Sunday. Marcus Freeman is the next true star head coach to emerge in this sport. Those of you who are strictly greaseboard football minded do not care about this, but it is the entertainment business after all. And so uh, Marcus Freeman has, has been the perfect guy. Marcus Freeman was the perfect guy at the right time to take classic Notre Dame and mesh it with new college football. They're recruiting better than they did when Brian Kelly was there. They've certainly been more active in the portal. Now, I can't prove to you that Freeman's operating under the exact same conditions that Brian Kelly did. Whomst amongst us knows. Well, maybe we should go up there and ask him. But I'm saying broad strokes purposes, the program's elevated. Not significantly. It's not like it's massively scaled. It couldn't massively scale. They were already in a really good place. But the program's elevated. I mean, you're talking about any given year. Like this year, their over-under win totals 10 and a half. Again, it's not, it's not a predictive ranking here. But that's where Notre Dame has been for a while. Previous staff, new staff. And we're going to talk about them later in the show. But how nice is it that your greatest initial concerns have been alleviated? Like, no one knew how Marcus Freeman was going to fare. You had supreme confidence in him. But no one really knew. Well, now you look and you think all the positives that still could be out there for you, but nobody's really worried whether he's going to be a bust anymore because now we're a few years into it, like Norvell at Florida State. People have long since stopped worrying about whether he's going to be a bust. Now you're just talking about how high he can ascend. I should have put Notre, I should have put Florida State behind Notre Dame. Uh, we'll get to him in a second. I got LSU as the number eight program in college football. I think there'll be a lot of debate as to whether Florida State should have been ahead of them. I'd probably listen to a lot of the debate because I had Florida State ahead of LSU like three hours ago. Uh, but the coin flip went LSU's way. High-end potential at LSU will always be championships. You've seen it with multiple staffs. Some staffs couldn't appear to walk and chew gum at the same time and yet won championships at LSU. So you always know it's possible. It's the inverse of the argument people have about Notre Dame. People look at Notre Dame and think there's a ceiling on the program. I will address that later. No one talks about that at LSU. Like LSU, if it has its own, uh, if it has its affairs in order, then LSU is going to be right in the thick of the national championship conversation. I also look. I, I um, I think there's some course correction happening in terms of coaching staff at LSU right now. I love what they did defensively. I cannot believe it came to that defensively. I cannot believe that I looked at them last year and watched them have the worst defensive coaching staff in the conference. Just pure numbers, okay? That's not even opinion. That's just pure numbers. Well, they, they addressed it in a big way. Now, the, the internal machinations of that and how that process actually happens, I think, is worth an entire book. Uh, Bruce Feldman does a lot of good books on college football. He ought to you know, this is not a good idea, Bruce, so don't do this, but I would be fascinated to read a book that details the actual hiring process. Head coach, coordinators, position coaches, I think it is the thing the public misunderstands the most about our sport. Just, just unbelievable. Anyway, uh, LSU nailed it, massively upgraded their defensive staff. I also think resources are top-notch there. Uh, they've won. It's not like they haven't been winning. The, the dude came in and beat Alabama and won the West his first year at LSU. Top-end potential is there. LSU is number eight, but LSU can be the top program in the country. So number eight for those folks isn't high enough. Florida State has reason to feel the same way. I've got Florida State as the number nine program in college football right now, and Florida State could be on their way to top five status. You can't do it overnight. Like I'm not vaulting them up there overnight. But uh, last year, I think in the minds of many, including myself, rooted out any kind of lingering doubt about whether Mike Norvell would be a long-term, like high-level winner. He will be. 
I have very little doubt about that. They've secured him. They've locked him up long term. Their recruiting is rapidly improving. Now, unlike some out there, they had the good sense to utilize that portal and get a winning product on the field immediately and then slowly transition to how you construct a roster. I think they've done about as good a job as anyone in managing roster construction in the new college football, which is funny when you juxtapose it to how some other programs in the ACC have chosen to operate. I think this year is pivotal on many fronts for them. Number one, it's just a year of college football. We don't ever waste those. But number two, you get to find out what Florida State University football is about as opposed to just what the 2023 team was about because you lost a lot of pieces off that. And there are a lot of new faces that have to contribute and emerge. And if you turn on Florida State week six or week seven and the product kind of looks the same all of a sudden again this year as it did last year, that is indication of a rock solid culture. Like that's a program more so than just an, an isolated team like Michigan State a couple of years ago had a ridiculously good team. Program was bad. Florida State's not going to be Michigan State, certainly not my prediction, but that's the difference. That's what you watch for. You watch for different instances that validate your belief. My belief is Florida State is a top 10 college football program right now. And I've still got Clemson as a top 10 college football program. So it could have put Tennessee up here, could have put Penn State, Utah, but I put Clemson still as a top 10 college football program. I think it's important to use the same scale here. By the Clemson scale, it feels like this program's fallen off, so to speak, a lot more than they actually have. So by the Clemson scale, you ought to be right there in the thick of the national championship conversation every year, and they haven't necessarily been that last couple of years. That's not the worst thing in the world. Um, in, in storm chasing, sometimes we have a tornadic supercell. It's already got a history of producing, and then it has to cycle. Or as Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt would say, it has to back build, and then it drops another tornado. Well, Clemson, maybe they're just back building. Maybe they're just cycling. There's no, there's no definitive proof that they've fallen off. And by the way, fallen off is a first world term here. That's why I'm talking about scale. If you use the same scale for Clemson as you do everyone else, they're still winning a lot of games. I'm not putting them in the top five, by the way. So, so don't argue with me they're overrated if you're going to. And preemptively, I'm anticipating that. Don't argue with me Clemson's overrated when I put them number 10 and then use programs like Oregon or Texas. I don't have them ahead of those, but I do have them ahead of, you know, like a Tennessee or a Utah uh, because their, their results have been comparable. And I still think there's a lot to say for the stability there. I think there's a lot to say for the culture there. Now, I think a lot of people have opinions on their talent acquisition strategy and how resistant they've been to really embracing the transfer portal. We've talked about that a lot on the show. Um, Difference is Dabo Swinney's not a rookie head coach. So might he be stubborn on this front? Might he be really entrenched in his ways? Yeah, but at least there's a proven philosophy there. And so if he's gonna fail, it really will just be because they didn't evolve with the game. But I'm always gonna give guys with proven track records benefit of the doubt. It wouldn't be the first time that the sport has sort of left a philosophy behind or passed a philosophy by. But, but it's also well within his right to continue to evolve, too. And just because they've, what, had a 9 or 10 win season last couple of years, I don't start, you know, etching dates on their headstone. I'm not quite there yet. I, I have them well down, like Clemson. Imagine a few years ago saying they're barely in the top 10 of college football programs. Again, it's a very first world slight to throw at someone. They could elevate. They could elevate as well. We'll see. Hearing good things about a, a certain freshman receiver over there, Cade Klubnick offense this year. Garrett Riley, second year as the coordinator. We'll see. So anyway, uh, in, in, in review, Georgia, Bama, Michigan, Ohio State, Texas, Oregon, Notre Dame, LSU, Florida State, Clemson. Those are my top 10 college football programs right now using the aforementioned blend of rolling criteria it's on-field results, it's talent acquisition, it's stability, it's resource pool, and I'm sure everyone will agree on every single part of this. I see no reason for debate. You know what? Debate anyway. It's fun. It is April after all.